In this program, we're going to be discussing family and reproduction issues. We're not going to dive too deeply into some of the topics, um, and hopefully I can keep this uh, delightfully short for you. Um, I just want to hit a few of the highlights that may uh, come up. I know that uh, hopefully in our discussions we will have uh, some conversation about some of the really uh, deep issues that there are in this area. So we'll be talking about uh, sterilization, we'll talk about assisted conception, we'll touch on abortion, and last but not least, we'll be dealing with uh, paternity. So let's jump in. Sterilization um, is a very um, codified process in most states, and Virginia is no exception. Um, a, a woman uh, must give written consent, as well as a man, um, for permanent sterilization. Um, the, the consent of a spouse is not required uh, for sterilization, um, but it must, the consent must be in writing. Um, that writing has to give all of the uh, risk benefits, alternatives, etc. Um, and there also has to be a 30-day cooling off period for anyone who is not a, a parent, either naturally or by adoption. Let's look a little bit at uh, um, minors and the mentally incompetent. Very disfavored uh, for permanent sterilization um, to uh, take place um, because of obviously historic uh, abuses of the of the mentally incompetent. Um, the uh, and and Virginia with the eugenics movement was right at the uh, heart of that in a classic case from the U.S. Supreme Court called Buck versus Bell. Um, the uh, um, and so the current posture is is that it requires um, that there not be any alternative to sterilization that um, it is in the child's or the mentally incompetent patient's best interest and that a judge signs off on it so it is uh, quite an onerous process um, that uh, uh, that take place for a to get a little more detail, for an impaired minor that is ages 14 to 18, the court must give approval for permanent sterilization on a clear and convincing evidence standard um, that the child would never be able to make an informed judgment on their own. Um, same similar process is in place for incompetent adults. Um, all such sterilizations have to have to be reported to the state registrar of vital records um, so that those can be tracked. Um, you know, it's not just something that the parents can decide that, you know, we really ought to do this. Um, it is not something that an institution can decide. Um, it, it requires that a court uh, pass judgment on it. Let's talk about uh, assisted conception. Um, again, there has been uh, a number of challenges um, in this area, and so um, We'll talk about mandatory disclosures to the patient. We'll talk about um, who's your mommy, who's your daddy. Um, and we'll also talk about surrogacy arrangements. Mandatory disclosures, um, the goal is to avoid the deceptive practices of the past. Um, very detailed um, disclosures have to be made to a, a couple um, in the process of the, the rate of success in that, in that facility has to be disclosed. Um, HIV screening protocols have to be disclosed. Um, the total number of live births have to be disclosed, as well as what that percentage is of retrieval cycles um, in that facility. Um, likewise, the, the rate of pregnancies and deliveries uh, per retrieval cycle has to be disclosed. Let's shift then to uh, parent uh, child designations in, sur in uh, artificial uh, conception situations. Um, there is a presumption that a child born of uh, a married couple is the child of that couple. So with that in mind, um, if um, the married husband and wife are, are both alive at the time of birth, um, then the donors have no standing um, in that situation. If um, the uh, one of the spouses die within 10 months prior to the birth, um, then there's still a presumption that the husband and wife are the parents. The uh, husband is still designated to be uh, the father if he consented to using his uh, sperm despite filing for divorce or an annulment or whatever else. 
and certainly the current controversy that we have out there, um, I call it the modern family problem, um, is that if you have uh, pre-embryos that are frozen by a couple, uh, that they have kind of fertilized an egg and it's out there sitting on ice, um, and then they break up. Um, who has ownership of that? Who are the parents of that? Um, what is the disposition of those? All of that is um, currently being litigated state to state. Um, the general consensus is, is that one can't be involuntarily made a parent um, if they have not consented to it. So uh, with that in mind, um, usually um, those embryos end up, pre-embryos end up being disposed of. Let's talk about um, surrogacy arrangements. Um, they are um, not um, something that you make a lot of money off of, allegedly in uh, the Commonwealth or in, it, or in hardly any other state. Um, you cannot be a broker um, and be paid for it, uh, for surrogacy. However, attorneys advising on surrogacy contracts can be compensated for it. So if you have a law license, have at it. Um, if you're just a someone in the community who would like to make a uh, an app for it, um, that's probably prohibited. Um, the contract itself requires that the court approve uh, the contract. Um, it can be uh, terminated any time before uh, conception occurs. Um, and in fact, the uh, surrogate um, has up to 180 days after the uh, last assisted conception to terminate the contract. If there is no court approval um, of, a, of a surrogacy contract, um, the court can go back and try to re figure out what that contract would look like um, and make one up more or less. Um, a surrogacy contract um, has to articulate a number of things, um, but some of the things that uh, are kind of spelled out by statute is, is that the intended parents are responsible for uh, the medical costs. However, um, they are not allowed to make clinical management decisions for the pregnancy. That is solely the surrogate's decision. You can imagine the situation where baby mama um, he is being micromanaged by um, the um, woman who will be um, the eventual mother, hopefully. Um, the, the law is very clear um, that um, the person carrying the fetus gets to make all the decisions about the fetus. Um, however, those who are the intended uh, surrogate parents um, have to pay for it. Where there is a, a contract that's approved, um, then that contract will take effect and the intended parents would then be uh, listed as the parents on the birth certificate um, going forward. Um, if the contract is vacated, ruled void, whatever, um, then the surrogate and her husband are presumed to be the parents um, and the intended parents would then have to adopt the child um, going forward. In the absence of a contract, um, kind of the old fashioned way, um, the gestational mother is presumed to be the mother of the child unless the intended mother is the genetic mother uh, of the child. Um, if the uh, either of the intended parents is a genetic parent, a parent um, then the intended father is, is presumably the child's father in a married couple. Um, unless um, the surrogate cancels the contract um, to which then for which her husband was a party to, then he's on the hook um, to be the father of the child. Um, if neither of the intended parents are genetic uh, parents of the, of the child, then the surrogate is considered to be um, the child's mother and her husband would be uh, considered to be the child's father in the absence of a contract. So I hope I've thoroughly confused you with all that. Let's uh, touch that third rail of abortion. Um, let's kind of set the stage in that the presumption of the state um, and the bias of the state in all settings is towards life. Um, whether that's at the end of life or at the beginning of life or somewhere in between, the state is an advocate for protecting people. Um, with that in mind, as you saw in Roe versus Wade, um, the Supreme Court has stated in a number of cases that the state therefore has an increasing interest as the pregnancy progresses 
At day one, the state has very little of any interest. At um, end of gestation, 36 weeks, um, the state has a tremendous interest in that unborn child. What um, the uh, states have done in, a, in an effort to um, work around the various Supreme Court decisions, which are not all entirely consistent, I'll give you, um, is to figure out how to put up as many barriers as they can to abortion. Um, that is, um, they've required written informed consent. You'll recall in Virginia Bruja a couple of years ago about requiring a uh, uh, intravaginal uh, ultrasound for all patients uh, contemplating uh, abortion. Um, almost all states have a cooling off period between the time that a written consent is signed and when the abortion could be uh, performed. Many states have very heavy regulation of uh, facilities. Um, Virginia, in essence, required that they be um, meet or exceed hospital standards uh, for these outpatient facilities. Um, the public purse strings are used um, to limit abortions in that whether an ongoing debate of whether Medicaid or other public funding would be used uh, to fund um, not only the abortion itself, but facilities that may perform abortions. Um, almost every state has a conscientious objector statute that says that anyone who objects to performing an abortion does not have to participate in it. Um, that uh, uh, is kind of obvious probably. Um, and last but not least, of course, is the situation of minors. Um, very difficult for a minor to uh, receive an abortion, but there are uh, exceptions that are out there that are available too um, to permit a minor to have uh, an abortion in, in, a, in the proper setting. Last but not least, um, let's talk about uh, paternity. Um, there is um, the uh, traditional proof, and that was, you can picture in the Wild West, that um, mom says, yeah, he's the one. Um, and the, the evidence had to do with, um, did the guy have access to the woman um, during an appropriate period of time? Um, and what did the neighbors say and so forth? Um, fairly crude by modern standards today, um, any question as to paternity tends to be relegated to genetic testing, but there is still a presumption that any child born during a marriage is the child of the husband um, in that marriage unless um, he you know, takes a swab of the kid and sends it off and uh, can prove that in fact he is not the father. There is an, an obligation, if not a bonus uh, system for hospitals to um, assure that paternity is, is uh, declared before a, a family leaves the hospital. And the reason for that is, is that not only are we wanting to make sure birth certificates are fully filled out, um, but we want to, um, to assure that um, any dads out there are obligated to pay child support. And uh, particularly since a lot of children are on um, Medicaid um, or other public health or public uh, uh, welfare uh, payments of some kind, um, then the public uh, institution, whether that's the state or the county or whatever, uh, however it's organized in a particular state, can go after uh, dad uh, to get him to pay his due uh, for that child. So you'll see a great push in hospitals uh, to get that blank filled out on the uh, birth certificate. 